have some discussions about that uh, after we hear about the various progress that's been made with respect to air capture technologies. So our first uh, talk is by Alain Gopart, and he is uh, currently a uh, uh, senior research scientist uh, in the uh, Professor George Orr's group at the Loker Hydrocarbon Research Institute, and his research is focused on the transformation of methane and CO2 into more valuable products and on CO2 capture technologies. Alain? Thank you for this kind introduction. And today uh, I will talk about some uh, regenerable uh, polyamine based solid absorbent for CO2 capture from the air that we developed at the Local Hydrocarbon Institute in, uh, at USC. Um, okay. So, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, our um, usage of uh, fossil fuel has increased tremendously and uh, it has allowed uh, unprecedented development of uh, human societies. And of course, this comes also with some uh, byproducts, namely CO2. Uh, we emit now about uh, 30 billion tons of CO2 per year. Uh, all this is released into, atmos into the atmosphere. On about half of the CO2 emissions, uh, currently about 15 billion tons per year, um, accumulates in the atmosphere. This has led to some uh, increase in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Presently, uh, about 400 ppm, and this in turn has led to some other problems like uh, global, global climate change on uh, ocean acidification and other environmental problems. Um, so why don't we use uh, some other alternative energy instead of fossil fuel, such as hydropower, geothermal energy, wind energy, solar energy, and so on. Um, wait, the, the main problem right now is the problem of cost. Uh, fossil fuel are still the biggest bargain we ever had. And uh, most of these renewable energy are intermittent, especially solar or wind. And they produce mostly electricity, which is difficult to store. So they have some problems. So another way to go is uh, to still use a fossil fuel, but uh, to uh, capture and sequester the CO2 in uh, such places as uh, depleted, uh, oops, sorry, depleted uh, uh, oil fields or natural gas fields or deep aquifer or even under the, the sea. Uh, but uh, we have also to make sure that once we put all the CO2 on the ground, it also stays there and it doesn't uh, uh, get released over time, which will make the whole operation uh, pointless. And um, none of this technology has uh, presently been uh, proven on the immense scale needed, namely billions of tons of CO2. So another possibility is uh, to do a carbon uh, capture and recycling to fuels and materials. This will actually give uh, a value to the CO2 that you capture. Uh, so there are different uh, uh, ways to capture CO2 depending on the sources of CO2. And uh, they, they, they include uh, absorption, adsorption, cryogenic separation, membranes, algal, uh, algal and microbial systems. But uh, most of them are not uh, well suited for the capture of CO2 from the air. And, um, Efficient uh, capture from this, uh, of CO2 from the air is still considered challenging by most. So one, one can ask the question, why capture CO2 from the air in the first place? So it's important to address about 50% uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, CO2 emission from small and distributed sources, such as home and office heating and cooling, and also uh, the transportation sector. Um, the collection of CO2 from billions of small uh, fossil fuel burning units uh, at the source is difficult and uh, in most cases not practical or economical. So direct air capture of CO2 would allow the collection of CO2 from any source, small or large or static or mobile. And this independence from the CO2 point of source means also that the capture unit could be placed anywhere offering considerable flexibility. And eventually, direct air capture could even be used to lower the atmospheric CO2 concentration in the air. Um, in fact, that's what nature does. It combines the CO2 with water uh, using uh, photosynthesis and chlorophyll and sunlight to form some carbohydrates and uh, new plant life. And um, in some way, we are using already this biomass to make biofuels, such as ethanol or biodiesel. 
But uh, as already said this morning, uh, biomass alone will not be able to fulfill uh, all our energy needs in a sustainable way. So from a thermodynamic point of view, CO2 capture from the air um, requires actually a relatively uh, low amount of energy, about 20 kilojoules per mole, to uh, concentrate it from uh, the 400 ppm in air to about one atmosphere. Um, the energy required uh, actually grows only logarithmically with dilution. So although we have uh, 250, 250 times less uh, CO2 in air than in a typical flue gas with 10%, the amount of energy required theoretically would only be about two to four times the energy needed to capture CO2 from uh, flue gases. So from a thermodynamic point of view, uh, direct air capture should not be an uh, unsurmountable problem. And actually, it's already used for some applications, such as the removal of CO2 in closed environment, such as submarines and spacecraft. Uh, also for the production of CO2 free air, so CO2 uh, air without CO2 for alkaline fuel cell and the batteries. And in the future, this uh, capture of CO2 could be used to sequester on, for sequestering and recycling to fuels and materials. The technology uh, for CO2 capture from the air are mostly based on chemisorbent, either usually inorganic uh, chemisorbent, such as uh, sodium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide, or organic and hybrid chemisorbent materials such as physically absorbed or immobilized amine and polyamine, or hyperbranched aminosilica or anionic exchange resins. Um, these adsorption and desorptions uh, are basically two mirror reactions. During the adsorption, uh, an, absorbent a, oops, an absorbent A reacts with CO2 uh, to unbind CO2. Uh, this uh, reaction is exothermic, it releases energy, and during the desorption step, uh, this uh, species uh, releases again CO2 and uh, the adsorbent, which can then be recycled. And this energy is endothermic, it means it's required, it requires energy. So the regeneration of the sorbent is actually the energy demanding step, which needs heat, vacuum, or other means of desorption. Um, usually, inorganic uh, sorbent, uh, such as calcium oxide, bind CO2 strongly. So there is a relatively high energy demand for the regeneration step. Um, other adsorbent that can be used, the organoamine hybrid absorbent, uh, bind CO2 less strongly and uh, require less harsh uh, condition for regeneration, such as temperature of only about 80 to 200 degrees. And they can be basically divided in three groups. Uh, uh, class one, uh, are amines and polymeric amines, physically adsorbed on the support material. Uh, class two are amine immobilized, so uh, chemically bound on the support. And class three are grafted polyamine prepared by in situ polymerization of an amine containing monomers such as aziridine. Um, at the local hydrocarbon institute, we decided to uh, focus our effort on finding an easy to prepare and inexpensive, but at the same time efficient absorbent based on class one hybrid material. And we had an interest for various reasons. First, to capture CO2 for recycling to fuels and materials such as methanol and dimethyl ether in the frame of uh, the methanol economy. But also to capture CO2 to produce uh, CO2-free air for use in iron air batteries uh, with an alkaline electrolyte, which would otherwise be uh, deactivated relatively fast with CO2. Uh, also for indoor air quality uh, to reduce the amount of CO2 in enclosed spaces. So the absorbent we actually prepared is very easy to prepare. It's based on uh, just dissolving uh, polyamine in methanol and mixing the solution in a suspension uh, of the support, also in methanol. Uh, after that, uh, the solvent is evaporated and the solid is dried. And uh, we, obtained a, sorry, we obtained a nice uh, a white solid, which can then be used for CO2 absorption. And this one is based on uh, Fume silica, FS on PPI, which is polyethylenamine, this species. And in this case, uh, we have different concentration of uh, PI going from 50 to 20%. Uh, this uh, uh, reaction of uh, polyethylenamine uh, with uh, CO2 forms a carbamate under dry condition. So, in theory, two amino groups are needed for each uh, CO2 molecule. But under humid condition, uh, we have the formation of a uh, bicarbonate, uh, in theory, you only need one amino group for each uh, molecule of CO2. So it could uh, 
absorb more CO2 under humid condition. So the experimental setup we used for uh, these uh, experiments of uh, um, separation of CO2 from the air, uh, we first uh, compressed uh, air from the lab, basically, and then with a mass flow controller, controlled the flow, uh, which went over this uh, adsorbent placed in a U-tube in a thermostated bath. And the gas coming out was then analyzed uh, by an infrared detector to detect how much CO2 is left in this gas. And uh, this is how it looks like in the lab. This relatively small installation. It's nothing like a pilot plant or something. And uh, to our surprise, um, during the first seven hours that we uh, passed uh, this air containing CO2 over that sorbent, uh, uh, we had almost uh, uh, CO2 free air coming out. So um, during this initial absorption uh, step, we absorb about 40, 39 uh, milligrams of CO2 per gram. After that, you had a breakthrough on the concentration of CO2 in the air coming out of that sorbent uh, uh, slowly increased uh, until complete saturation. So of course, this uh, adsorption of CO2 is going to depend on a number of factors, such as the amount of uh, PEI loaded on the support. and. Uh, in general, uh, we observed a higher uh, CO2 absorption for higher uh, PI loadings. Um, but the absorption was actually uh, faster on the adsorbents with lower PI loading because of an easier access to the active sites by CO2. And depends also on the flow rate, of course. But uh, we, we could see that even increasing the flow rate to uh, one liter per minute uh, over these three grams of adsorbent, we still had a complete uh, adsorption of the CO2. So it means all the CO2 that we, we passed over, contained in the air that we passed over the adsorbent, was still adsorbed for quite a while. And it depends also on the molecular weight of the PI. So in general, uh, the lower the molecular weight, the higher the adsorption. And we could obtain uh, adsorption up to almost 110 milligram per gram with the polyethylenamine with a molecular weight of uh, 800. Um, it depends also on the temperature. And uh, in our case, uh, with this uh, fume silica PEI containing 50% uh, PEI, um, the, big, uh, the, the best adsorption was obtained uh, at uh, about 25 to 35 degrees. After that, we had a um, dramatic decrease in the adsorption uh, capacity of the adsorbent. And at 85, basically, no more adsorption was uh, um, observed. And this is important because it means that the adsorbent could be regenerated at relatively mild temperature, uh, 70 to 100 degrees C. Um, of course, the higher the temperature, uh, the faster the desorption rate. So this is at 70 and 85 on 100 degrees C. So it takes less time to dissolve at higher temperature. Um, we also run some uh, cycling. Uh, in this case, uh, it's, this is only four cycles. So um, we didn't see any uh, significant decrease in absorption capacity of this uh, four cycle absorption of CO2 from the air. And uh, we did also cycling over a longer period of time, although here I have to say it's 85% uh, CO2 in nitrogen. This is just to show that uh, there's basically no decrease in absorption capacity over this, uh, this time of more than 120 cycles. And uh, we also checked the effect of humidity. And uh, it had actually a positive effect on the adsorption. And uh, we observed almost a 50% increase in absorption from 52 milligram per gram to 78 milligram per gram. And this is uh, consistent with the formation of uh, bicarbonates here in the presence of water. And uh, just as a comparison, in the case of zeolites, uh, humidity, humidity stops almost entirely the absorption of CO2. So this is a good point for this adsorbent. So in conclusion for this uh, CO2 absorption from the air using uh, fume silica uh, on PI adsorbent, uh, so, of course, the adsorption uh, of CO2 from the air is technically feasible. And I mean, based adsorbent show promises. They have relatively high adsorption uh, capacity, even under humid condition. The regeneration temperature is relatively low, 70 to 100 degrees C. And they have fast kinetics of reactions. 
uh, they are also easy to prepare by using a relatively inexpensive uh, starting material. And uh, yeah, like I already mentioned, humidity improves the absorption of CO2 on these uh, the materials. And they seem to be a promising absorbent for air purification in closed environment or alkaline fuel cell. And in the future, they could be also, as also already discussed this morning, used uh, in a kind of anthropogenic, anthropogenic uh, carbon cycle, mimicking nature's own photosynthetic cycle, in which uh, we would have uh, um, CO2 capture from the atmosphere and then uh, recycling to fuels and materials, including methanol and DME, using uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, renewable energy. And then uh, the cycle will be closed by burning again these fuels. And uh, we're also a proponent of the, what we call the methanol economy. So we have a few publications in this field. And uh, so thank you for your attention. And we'd also like to thank uh, the UFC Local Hydrocarbon Institute and RPAI and DOE for some funding. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation will be by uh, Carl Slackner. Not that he needs introduction, but he's the UN. Wurzel Professor of Geophysics and Director of the Lenten Center for Sustainable Energy at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. So, I'm delighted to be here and be able to talk to you all. And I decided I want to talk this time essentially about progress we have made over the last year or two. Uh, in part, I do this to make it very clear that we actually do share our data and try to make them publicly available. In part, I want to find out, which one do I use? The, oh, the big one. This one. In, in part, I want to put it uh, because we can actually drive costs down over time. But I do want to start out with a big overview again about why air capture is interesting, and I think the, this has been said best by Sarovitz and Nelson in a paper some time ago in Nature, in which they basically said if you, if you want a technological fix, and let's face it, capturing carbon dioxide from the air is a technological fix a technological society got itself into, uh, you need three things. It largely has to embody cause and effect, uh, and thereby make it obvious to everybody that it actually solves a problem. And it has to be accessible. You have to be sure that you actually did something. And lastly, it clearly has to, to not only work, but it, there has to be a, te a technological core that already is there, otherwise you cannot sell it. And he then went, they went then on to say and applied these ideas to air capture, and they said if you look at it, uh, it very clearly embodies that cause and effect idea. Uh, if you put CO2 into the atmosphere, it doesn't belong there. You take it back out, you clearly did what you needed to do. Uh, you can easily measure how much you took out, so it's accessible whether you were successful or not. And if you didn't, if, you know it, the CO2 comes down or it doesn't go up, you can tell how many millions of tons you took care of. And so it ultimately comes down to the feasibility question. Do we have it? Do, do, do we, can we make it work? And they, they remarked on the fact uh, that there's hardly any effort going into this, and they were wondering why. So we, and, it, and I, I would like to argue, yes, if you look at standard separation technologies, air capture is a stretch. There is no, cap, no question and no if and but about it. Uh, we are not going to get there by simply extrapolating. So the underlying principle we took is we said, well, we have to make the air do our work. And clearly, the air can carries kinetic energy, so we shouldn't run big fans to blow the air around. It also uh, carries thermal energy, and it turns out in our filters, which absorb the CO2, the air actually cools because it removes water from that filter material. And in doing so, it actually drives the chemistry of the process. People have pointed out this is an enormous amount of energy, but it is in essence for free because the air coming in drops by roughly one degree in temperature as it moves through the system. Uh, and it's like perspiration on a hot day. This is why this ultimately works. And it, in effect, carries uh, chemical potential because the air was not saturated in water. And after we are done with it, we will be more saturated. So our recommendation is take advantage of the resources you have to make it work. I don't want to belabor this point, but I did want to point it out. 
I do think there is no debate anymore about the thermodynamics, although in the early days you heard people say it's thermodynamically impossible. It's about 22 kilojoules per mole, and all of this uh, is very well approximated by the RG log P you saw a second ago. It's roughly logarithmic in the, in the scale. It costs you more than scrubbing a power plant but not orders of magnitude more because it's simply logarithmic. So the thermodynamics is not the problem. And in our case, it gets even simpler because we evaporate water, and you can read this as being a source of energy or just another chemical coming in. Any which way you read it, this is the cheapest free energy I can buy in a way. If I ask how much free energy is in a cubic meter of water, and if I pay 20 cents for a cubic meter, I just paid half a cent per kilowatt hour, I mind you, for free energy, not for that enormous, enormous amount, amount of thermal energy we talked about. This is the, the real thing we have to pay for. So lastly, people have said, but that's all fine and good. The separation technologies, however, in practice, scale linearly in the dilution, not logarithmically. And here is a bunch of examples where you see basically the price of metals nicely scaling along that, that rule. And this is in 1980 numbers, 1985 numbers, $10 per ton of ore. What I concluded from that, that, that's the price of a metal. If you know how much diluted it was and you take the original ore, it's $10 per ton. If you take that number and you work backwards, you realize that even in 1980 numbers, which you could pay for, was digging up the ore, crushing and grinding it, run one flotation, and get rid of the tailings. So basically what it says, the first step dominates everything else. And of course, on this scale, we look ridiculously uh, uh, ambitious. And I put you here at $20 because I sort of re reinflated backwards to 1980 numbers and see where you would come out. But I would like to point out we are not the only point that far away from the curve. You may notice bromine from seawater. But more recently, recently, uranium from seawater. Uranium in seawater is three parts per billion. And if, if I were to take uh, uh, Sherwood's law as a, as a fixed rule, as a thermodynamically equivalent rule, uh, this would be millions of dollars per kilogram. Instead, they claim they can do this somewhere between $300 and $1,000. And they actually demonstrated this. And they did this passively. They have what they call artificial kelp. They have strands of resin, which are buoyant, floating in the water. And for months, they just load up. And by the time you process those for their uranium content, you have completely forgotten how diluted it was in the ocean because you enriched it. So basically, Sherwood's rule is a rule of thumb and not uh, a thermodynamic rule. There are ways around it. And here is one concrete example. I didn't prove to you that we are getting around. But I can, can show that it's not impossible to get around. So I'm arguing, in general, the cost has a linear term, because clearly you have to process the input. Then there is a log term, which has to do with the thermodynamics. And what we need to show is that the first term is cheap. Hence, I want to be passive. I don't want to touch, the, I don't want to touch that air. I don't want to touch anything, really, until I have the CO2 on the sorbent, and then get it back. And the cost of getting it back is that log term not the linear term up front, which indeed is a killer. And by the way, by extrapolation, if you told, told me we made a horrible mistake and it's 400 parts per billion and not 400 parts per million, uh, I would come to the conclusion it's not possible because now the first term would indeed dominate. So having said that, we have an anionic exchange resin, which absorbs CO2 from the air uh, when it's dry, and it gives it back when it's wet. We can drive up, we call this a moisture swing, we can drive up the CO2 content to roughly 5% of an atmosphere and maintain that during loading and unloading cycles. The basic idea is when the resin is wet, it's in the, car in the carbonate state. As it dries out, it actually splits into a bicarbonate and a hydroxide. That hydroxide has an enormous affinity to CO2. It loads up to the bicarbonate. You make it wet again, the, the system repeats itself. So, that's as a background. Let me now spend my last few minutes uh, on figuring out uh, what progress we have made on that. So we had anionic exchange resins before. You had seen them in this, last, in this picture here. These were plastic sheets out of polypropylene with the finely ground resin embedded into there. Uh, people have suggested why not make fibrous mats of some sort or another. And we actually decided to make better form factors by literally making paper. So we, we, we did a paper making process and we ended up with a, with a resin matrix where the very fine powders of the resin uh, 
were attached to the paper. And one of the things we lucked out on is the new resin particles tend to be positively charged. The paper fibers tend to be negatively charged. And so this is a marriage uh, where there's a strong adherence between them. And you can shake this. It doesn't actually fall out. The second thing is we need to protect ourselves from salt water. We are anionic exchange resins. If we dip things in salt water, uh, we get a chloride exchange for the carbonate, and the system stops. So we need to stop that. And lastly, we are interested in alternative sorbents. I will tell you a little bit about that. And we have some molecular dynamics results. What is not on here, we are also working very hard on getting thermodynamics data on it. I think I'll wait to tell you that once we publish them. So here is actually a paper wheel we made. Think of this as an air filter where the air blows through right through this page. And this will absorb CO2 actually faster, better than before. But because it's paper, if I hose this off with water, it, <laughs> it'll do not quite as well. But we will have to figure out how to make this work. The second thing we figured out is that there are certain materials. Tyvek is my favorite example, which is a brand name of DuPont, which is a polyolefin fiber, which makes a, mat a matrix, a sheet like paper, uh, which is very, very hydrophobic, but at the same time porous enough that vapors, air and vapor can go through. So we literally made pouches of it. Here you see a tiny one for, for experimental purposes, where the resin is in that little envelope. And we can show that it happily absorbs CO2 while in there. And we can literally dip this in seawater. And the CO2 will, will be coming off without the seawater liquid physically actually getting in touch with, with, the, with the resin. But the water vapor will get through because, of course, once it's dipped into water, the, the, the gas volume around these particles is saturated with water vapor. And so we are quite capable of picking up things that way. La lastly, we did measure various other materials for their ability to absorb CO2. And we found out activated carbon binds CO2, but it has no humidity swing that is detectable. It doesn't respond much to that. Uh, by the same token, if you have a carbonate brine or even a carbonate powder, it clearly can absorb CO2 at high enough partial pressures of CO2. But again, it doesn't show a humidity swing. But if you impregnate carbon, uh, activated carbon matrix with uh, potassium or sodium carbonate, it actually exhibits a very clear humidity swing. So what we are arguing is what, what we have in that anionic exchange resin are positive ions uh, being distributed and bound to the matrix, and carbonates or hydroxides and bicarbonates in the matrix. And the same seems to happen into the fine pores of the carbonate, but not quite as dramatic. What we found is we have a very strong moisture swing in the volumes involved, but rather than bumping up the CO2 partial pressure by making things moist by about 500 fold, we may be only doing it tenfold. So it is a noticeable swing, but it is not so large that I would run out and buy stock in activated carbon. So here are examples we can now, because we have these little pockets, measure all sorts of things and get fairly accurate data because we can, we can measure the moisture uptake of these resins without the pocket picking up water. Originally, we tried to do this with a paper, but then we found out the paper itself absorbs a lot of water, and that didn't work all as well. Here you see three, three swings behind each other. So you see the water control in blue. We make it dry. The CO2 is being slightly absorbed. We make it wet because they're nearly loaded. We make it wet, it releases. And so you see that the original membrane material we had nicely responds. The same membrane material embedded into a Tyvek envelope still works just fine. It's a little slower. The kinetics is being affected. The fact that it's higher just says it was more loaded when it started. And then the last one is actually the activated carbon inside one of those Tyvek envelopes. So you see it works just fine. But we have done in the meantime also experiments where we see how much we pump, pump the equilibrium up by going from dry to wet. It's about an order of magnitude, whereas before it was about a factor 500. So clearly, this is not as good as the activated, uh, as the, the ion exchange resin, but it is in the same ballpark. Lastly, and one of my graduate students, uh, Yang Shi, uh, is working on this. And he has done a marvelous job of setting up uh, molecular dynamics codes, trying to simulate what we do. Most of this is done in public domain software because it's more affordable. 
and it's also far more flexible. We can change the code if we have to, uh, because nobody really solved our problem in the past. And so he has set up all sorts of configuration. Here you see some graph graphene sheets uh, mocking up, if you wish, the poly polypropylene. And in between, you see water molecules and carbonate ions. And so we have worked this out to various levels. And the basic idea is we can take uh, water with ions in it, remove one carbonate ion and one water, and see how much energy we paid. And we do the same thing to one which had one bicarbonate and one hydroxide instead, and remove those two, take the difference, and calculate what we get. And what we actually found, and I'll close on this, is the observation that as you remove water, the free energy of the reaction starts to favor the carbonate hydroxide combination over the, the, the bicarbonate hydroxide combination over the carbonate plus water, which says that even in these crude models, you see the beginnings of a, of a moisture swing effect being built in. So we, I think, for the first time actually have some theoretical understanding of what it is we are observing. We have seen it. Uh, we have kicked its tires experimentally, but we still are probing what exactly is going on, and I'm very pleased that we have this, this first slightly preliminary at this point, but nevertheless quite robust result that we can show that we can do this. So in summary, uh, we have an approach to the problem. Uh, we are developing it further. I think there's a whole family of sorbents we haven't begun to discuss yet. And we are getting an understanding how it works. And we have learned how to protect the material against harsh outside. Uh, and so we have, as a result of that, we most likely can use seawater or brackish water or dirty water to, do, to force our humidity swing without having to make DI water or at very least very clean fresh water to run the system. I think that's a major step forward, which allows us to drive costs down. And I'll close on that. Thanks so much. OK, for the third uh, presentation, John Gibbons is the director of the United Kingdom Carbon Capture and Storage Research Center. He's also a member of the Pilot Scale Advanced Carbon Technology PACT Executive Board on behalf of the University of Edinburgh and manages ACTROM satellite facilities at the University of Edinburgh. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I'm going to go through a rather higher level view of activities in the UK, just to give you an overall impression of, of things we're looking at. Um, fortunately, I'm backed up by Tim Kruger, who's sitting there in the audience, who uh, was also present at the meeting I'm going to summarise. Um, but before I start, just to give a bit of a background to where the UK is in terms of its thinking on carbon capture and storage and abatement generally, um, we're looking quite a lot at going to very high levels of emission reduction. We have a national target, a legal target, of 80% reduction by 2050, and a stated objective of going beyond that after 2050. Uh, Miles Allen at the University of Oxford, some of you will be familiar with his work, um, says, well, look, we probably can tolerate a cumulative emissions of about a trillion tonnes of carbon from the start of the Industrial Revolution. We've used about half of that. Um, the problem for tackling uh, climate change is simply to make sure that we never emit the trillionth tonne, which then translates into introducing 100% carbon capture and storage before you get there. And clearly some of that carbon capture and storage would have to be air capture in one form or another from some of the more difficult targets. And this is now actually you know, getting fairly well accepted um, in government circles, in policy circles in the UK. We haven't really gone on to, well, we have gone on to negative emissions in, in some areas, but mainly for mitigation. Uh, and as I'm sure some of you are aware, a number of companies, including Shell, also subscribe to the trillion tonne target uh, as, a, as a matter of policy. So I'm going to report very briefly on a meeting we had at Imperial College as part of the centre um, about a month ago, looking at negative emissions. Uh, you can look on the website. I don't think the presentations are up just yet because we had a few other meetings, but they will be there. And the background to this, some people are saying, why isn't direct air capture in policy? Well, the UK, for, for its own 2050 targets, has quite a detailed energy calculator. Uh, and as part of the 
joint of the, um, the next set of climate change negotiations, DEC, led by David Mackay, the chief scientist, uh, also of Cambridge, uh, is coming up with a global greenhouse gas calculator. So this has been worked on by a number of institutions. Um, this is the, the objectives, which is really looking at, at how you actually get the sort of targets we're, we're trying to get. Uh, the target audience, uh, business leaders, NGOs and governments, and the final version will be out at the end of this year, and it's being used ahead of the 2015 negotiations. It's a very conscious bit of quantitative, first stab at a, a global quantitative model. These are the institutions. It's got about a million pounds worth of funding. And then re removal technologies, biochar, the maximum estimate of 3.3 gigatons of CO2 a year, direct air capture, technology unspecified, 10, enhanced weathering, enhanced weathering in the oceans, another 10, ocean fertilization, one, and also forestry, land use, and BECS, biomass energy with CCS. So it's actually there, it's part of the UK policy now that, that this may need to be used. And I think that's, that's actually one of the questions you're asking, Pete, you know, when, when is it gonna be there? Well, it is there, it's the thin end of the wedge, but it's definitely, definitely coming. So what were we talking about then at the meeting in terms of direct air capture? Well, one of the processes uh, was a lime-based process that Ben Anthony, late of CanMet, some of you may know him from Canada, now very welcome uh, addition to the UK CCS Research Centre in Cranfield University, is looking at the lime process. Uh, Tim also presented on a, another lime-based process. If you want to get the details, ask him over there. Uh, also looking at a fixed bed process for actually relatively small unit air capture. This is a colleague of mine at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, this is on a project funded, government funded, by the Research Council. So again, we are getting a small amount of government funding coming into this. Ben's project also government funded. Looking at uh, selective adsorption stages using nanotubes. And then finally, a fair bit of work on BECS. We're doing a lot of work on BECS supply. This is some work out of Imperial College, um, looking at biomass availability uh, and how you would optimize biomass transport and supply to a range of power plants in the UK. So the equivalent, the, the estimate there is, as you can see, something like a quarter of the UK's transport emissions might be offset, or transport emissions at the moment, might be offset by BEX. And this actually is the first BEX power plant that we're looking at in the UK. So I thought I'd just say a little bit, this is one of the two projects which are receiving some tens of millions of pounds of government support to go through a front-end engineering design study uh, with a view to making a final investment decision on whether to build them in 2015 uh, this is an oxyfuel project actually being built largely with US technology uh, by Alstom, technology coming out of Windsor, Connecticut, um, but also involving uh, BOC Lindy, uh, National Grid doing the transport and storage uh, in a consortium known as the White Rose Project, White Rose being the Yorkshire, Yorkshire symbol. This is based at the existing Drax power plant, one of the biggest power plants in Europe, and this has already converted one of its units to a wholly biomass operation. They're big units. I think it's about 400 megawatts on biomass. Um, this other unit, the, the oxyfuel, will be about 350 net megawatts output. And interestingly, this is just a, a better view of the plant. You can see the two, two oxygen units in the foreground uh, behind the cooling towers. There's a lot of, lot of mention of biomass in here. And in fact, I think one of the main, objection, main objections to actually going negative on this unit is we actually, interestingly in the UK, have quite a good incentive for ordinary, biomass, uh, ordinary um, CCS plants. We basically have a feed-in tariff for which, which treats renewables, nuclear, and CCS on a more or less level footing. Uh, we've got a process called electricity market reform going through. So we can do that, but it doesn't go negative. And of course, 
the European Emission Trading Scheme, which actually wouldn't have very much money in it anyway, but that doesn't go, doesn't recognise negative emissions either. So one of the things we're actually going to be looking at, this is in the centre over the next few months, is how you reward negative emissions, which of course I think will think how it would re reward air capture as well if and when that became available. So a lot of, lot of debate about the, the viability of the fuel supply, which is why obviously we're, we're also interested in engineered direct air capture. Um, I should also mention, particularly if we can get uh, biogenic uh, methane, we've got another project which could also go in for air capture, which is capture on natural gas. So in the UK we do believe that capture on natural gas is technically and economically viable and uh, the, other, the other project that's getting the tens of millions of pounds for a feed study is a project being done by Shell uh, with a little bit of help from Scottish and Southern Electricity uh, at the Peterhead site. So this is going, both of these projects use offshore storage. The Drax project uses quite a long pipeline. Peterhead goes directly offshore. There's a lot of, a lot of pipelines coming in. Uh, this is using Canadian technology, CanSolve technology, for the capture unit. So where are we? Negative emission technologies. Well, there's a clear interest in negative emissions uh, in various forms, and these come between the UK CCS Research Centre and also the CO2 Chem Network, which is basically, CO2 Chem is basically looking at making things uh, that can be sold from CO2, things to give an economic advantage. I've given you the website for it there. Peter Styring, who some of you may know of, is the director of that network. Um, BEX is still well established, but interestingly, no, no incentive. Um, we're doing some fundamental R&D on other systems, I don't think uh, as much as in the US even, um, but you never know, it could, could start growing, particularly as we can see that there's some policy drivers behind it. There's cross-learning with conventional CCS. I think I sometimes wonder here to be, we could miss out the, everything but the cross, right? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, and then I think certainly in the UK, um, carbon capture and storage and negative emissions are just seen as part of a spectrum. Of, of getting going, getting closer to zero and then obviously going beyond zero uh, as and when you can. But I think for a long time we're expecting that if you do have direct air capture in whatever form, it will be offsetting emissions elsewhere. And we're reasonably happy to do that. Thank you.